So during the global war on terror, the Pentagon started to lean really heavily on these small, innovative group of teams that essentially got around the red tape at the Pentagon and got around the normal bureaucratic structures in order to develop new tactics, hone new doctrine, or acquire new technology. Uh, these programs, the Asymmetric Warfare Group, Red Team, and the Rapid Equipping Force are actually on the chopping block now as the Pentagon starts to shift towards great power competition. To find out more about what the impact of these cuts may be, we spoke to Dave Barna, who led coalition forces in Afghanistan from 2003 to 2005, and Nora Ben-Sahel, who's a defense policy scholar and teaches at Johns Hopkins University. Together, they wrote the book Adaptation Under Fire, which discusses how militaries change in wartime. Thank you guys for coming. I know that you guys are really busy, so I appreciate you guys taking the time out to do this. You um, touched a little bit on why you thought that the Army had you know, made the decision to shutter these programs. Can you give us any insight into why you think the decision was made to cut these specifically? Yeah, the Army is operating under some significant uh, budget constraints, and the likelihood is that defense budgets are going to continue to go down in the future. We may be uh, seeing the high watermark of the defense budget for years to come right now. So I think part of that was to save some money and to reinvest those resources into uh, combat formations and to free it up that way. But as you said, the amounts of money involved, the amounts of personnel involved are, are relatively small, which is why I think the budget explanation doesn't account for all of it. I, I do think that uh, these organizations that were set up to get around the usual processes that were too slow to be able to adapt to the realities of warfare in Iraq and Afghanistan also made them uh, vulnerable afterwards as those they are seen as uh, countering what the bureaucracy will do and uh, generating ideas that don't fall neatly within uh, the traditional parameters of the various pieces of the army and the army staff. And I think I'd add to that, that uh, I think there's a wrong-headed notion that these organizations are really only designed for irregular warfare, that, that don't really have a role to play in major power competition. And I also think that the Army now, especially perhaps with Army Futures Command coming on board, has is making the argument that all of these things should be able to be done by this new organization by, that's designed to be groundbreaking, designed to be innovative, and that these are really, in a sense, competitors for this new four-star headquarters. Uh, none of the three organizations we're talking about have got four-star sponsors right now. And so now when budget cuts came around, there wasn't really anybody out there to defend them. And again, I think the competition in effect in some ways is with Army Futures Command here in terms of what the Army envisions it being able to do in the future. And the jury is going to be very much out on that for some time. Another topic we discussed is whether these two experts saw any sort of issue with rapidly shifting away from counterinsurgency conflict and moving towards large-scale warfare. Well, I think there's a variety of challenges there. You know, number one, the reality is that war is going to occur across the spectrum. Uh, that's going to go from the high end with, you know, high intensity conventional warfare, perhaps all the way to nuclear warfare, all the way down to the low end that now may be subversion, political warfare, uh, disinformation, things that we've written about and we actually teach uh, some of our coursework on. The, the idea that we can focus the military as a whole and focus the army in particular on only the high end of this spectrum is, I think, problematic. We, we've done this before. We, in a sense, did this after the Vietnam War. I, I was in that army and I watched us, you know, essentially erase all the lessons of counterinsurgency that we learned in Vietnam you know, before my time in the army and then go full bore into air land battle and fighting against, uh, you know, the Soviet threat and, and really staying on that as the principal direction of the army for several decades. That didn't prepare the army particularly well for Iraq and Afghanistan, as we, as many, many of our current soldiers uh, could attest to over the last two decades. And, and we may well be in a position where we're going to repeat a similar mistake here going forward. That's that's troubling to think through, and I think I'm sure it's particularly troubling to those that are serving in the army today and then spend a good bit of their uh, their career in uniform, you know, fighting irregular wars uh, in remote places that that they don't want to have that experience, you know made uh, irrelevant or disappear entirely as, as we saw after Vietnam. Yeah, I think there's a great risk that we're going to repeat that in the uh, Pentagon's push to focus on the new realities of great power competition. I think in the Pentagon that has uh, too often been interpreted as focusing on great power conflict. Of course, the US military needs to be prepared for a potential conflict with uh, its great power adversaries. But it also 
precludes a focus on things at the lesser ends of the combat spectrum, as General Barno was just mentioning, and also the way that irregular wars and proxy wars can be an element of the competition phase without direct conflict among the major powers. So the way these two authors crystallize all these problems that they've discussed is through this concept called the adaptability gap, and they say that it's growing. Yeah, we started the book from the premise that the U.S. military, and frankly, any military, can't effectively predict what its future conflicts are going to be. Former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates once said, the U.S. has a perfect record of predicting its next war. Since Vietnam, we have never once gotten it right. So there's always a difficulty in predicting what the next challenge is going to be, but there are a number of reasons that we think that challenge is growing even more in the current environment, uh, largely because there are so many changes in the strategic environment, so much uncertainty, and the pace of technological change is ever increasing. So it's always been difficult to adapt. Adaptability has always been important for military forces. They come into the war with one idea and then they need to execute a war that may look very different. Uh, but we argue in the book that the, the gap that needs to be filled, that, that the scope of adaptation that may be needed is increasing and poses an even greater challenge for the US military going forward than it has in the past. Yeah, I think I would just add to that that uh... You know, whereas we've always recognized that there's going to be this gap and we, we kind of use the face of a clock as a way to illustrate this. You know, if your expectation of what the next war is going to look like is at the 12 o'clock and you, you know, develop your leaders for that conflict, you uh, develop your doctrine to be able to fight the conflict and you buy equipment that looks at that war you think is going to look like 12 o'clock. And then inevitably the war looks like two o'clock when it actually arrives and you have to you know, adjust, you know, a couple couple clock spaces over to be able to fight that war effectively. We, we're arguing now that it's not going to be two o'clock. It's going to be four o'clock, five o'clock, seven o'clock. There's going to be a vast amount of difference between the war you expect and the war that actually unfolds, largely because of all these myriad of unpredictable factors out there that we're seeing today that wouldn't have been the case, you know, 20, 30, 50 years ago. Concepts like the adaptability gap are big issues that Pentagon officials really need to start thinking about but there's no clear cut answers right now. We here at Military Times will continue to cover this as it develops.